You all know my name is Jerry Armstrong, and I'm here from Canada. This is my fourth visit to Russia. I was in, first of all, Nizhny Novgorod, Ekaterinburg, uh, Novosibirsk, and now Moscow. <laughs> I, I wish to speak uh, briefly tonight about uh, an aspect of Scientology which, which makes the organization dangerous. And then I'll uh, attempt to explain why I'm here in Russia another time. Some of you may have seen a rather famous video of the most famous Scientologist, Tom Cruise. This was published on the internet in 2008, and it was made by Tom Cruise at the time he received, in 2004, Scientology's uh, Freedom of Valor Award. Uh, Tom talks about uh, people that are referred to as suppressive persons or SPs. And SPs, uh, Scientology teaches, are the most evil 2.5% of people on the planet. And Tom says he welcomes the day when there will be no SPs left on Earth. Scientology teaches that uh, suppressive persons are basically equivalent to what are known in the psychology science as sociopaths or psychopaths. And Scientology teaches that they cannot be cured and that they are responsible for all accidents, illness, and every evil on earth. I am an SP. In, in truth, <laughs> in truth, uh, Scientology does not attack or go after real criminals, real psychopaths, real sociopaths. SPs or suppressive persons are simply ordinary people in every walk of life who tell the truth about Scientology. The suppressive person doctrine makes Scientology a criminal organization. The enforcement or application of the suppressive person doctrine is known by the name Fair Game. And the founder of Scientology L. Ron Hubbard uh, wrote extensively about suppressive persons. So the suppressive person, doc the, when he wrote about it, he said in Scientology policy, which they call scripture, that SPs are fair game. They may be tricked, lied to, cheated, stolen from, and destroyed. Scientology <coughs> declared me an SP in early 1982 and have fair gamed me ever since. Besides the assaults, physical assaults that I mentioned, I have been run into physically with a car. This was by a, an agent hired by Scientology. They terrorized my wife and me on a freeway in Southern California and they did similarly with uh, myself and friends on an autobahn in Germany. They have sued me six times, driven me into bankruptcy. They've tried to have me prosecuted on false criminal charges, including with the FBI, the uh, district attorney in Los Angeles, and even the legal authorities in Ekaterinburg. The suppressive person doctrine is used to uh, terrorize Scientologists keep them in a constant state of fear, and likewise to terrorize people like myself yeah. who is outside the organization. They have uh, created and disseminated around the world a mass of what they call black propaganda. It was Hubbard's uh, practice and policy to destroy people's reputations, credibility, livelihoods, relationships, and their lives with black PR. And if you look up who Jerry Armstrong is on the internet, 
you will find a mass of black PR about me. They disseminated black PR on me, calling me a criminal and worse right here in Russia, including to the FSB. And they also attempted to get the United States Embassy here in Moscow to pick me up. The suppressive person doctrine is uh, what is used to justify the breakup of families. If Scientology declares someone a suppressive person, other Scientologists may not communicate to them and pursuant to their policy may not even grant them credence. Uh, there, are, there is an element in Scientology, however, that does deal with suppressive persons and they deal with them in an aggressive criminal manner. Scientology is actually at war and because, however, they, they cannot pick up guns and cannot bomb us just for fear of prosecution much of their attacks on suppressive persons like myself are in secret, covert intelligence matters. The fact that Scientology and Scientologists are at war is learned one of the first things that a new Scientologist learns is that they are at war. And consequently, Scientologists virtually automatically know that they are to attack, to ruin the lives of any suppressive person. So, to me, the suppressive person doctrine is unjustifiable. There is no excuse, it is indefensible. The closest historical uh, parallel would be the Nazis Untermensch doctrine. So the way that the Nazis treated the Jews is very similar to the way Scientology treats or would like to treat suppressive persons. The suppressive person doctrine justifies an endless array of immoral and criminal activities. Scientology is under incredible pressure around the world and more and more people are becoming educated about the organization. I think that that can be evidenced just by the number of people here who, who have come to hear about the organization. Scientology cannot spread, uh, stop the spread of information now about its practices and about its intentions. And as the pressure mounts on Scientology, also the risk, the threat to individuals like me and to other people in society mounts. And yet there is no choice but to keep talking and keep educating people and keep spreading the word. And I would like to thank all of you for coming here and for being willing to listen and I hope and pray that you also spread the word. And I would like now to just touch on my legal situation and what brings me here specifically at this time. I am subject uh, to an order in the United States which prohibits me from even saying the word Scientology. How Scientology obtained that order is a very long story, but it essentially involves massive abuse of the legal process. And while I am prevented from saying the word Scientology or mentioning one word about my now 42 years of experience and knowledge about this organization, Scientology believes, and the court has agreed with them, that they can say whatever they want about me, no matter how false or defamatory, and I cannot respond. This order is 
on penalty of $50,000 per utterance. So this is a very valuable talk to you. I am also subject to another order which permits Scientology to have me jailed and further fined for anything I say. I, I cannot talk about Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, any Scientology organization, including all of their directors, officers, employees, volunteers, agents, and attorneys. Similarly with uh, Scientology's affiliated organizations or entities, such as their front groups, Criminon, Narconon, Citizens Commission on Human Rights, that's the organization that they use to attack psychiatry, their volunteer minister organization, uh, their Way to Happiness organization. The Way to Happiness is a little booklet that oh, Hubbard wrote please. that Scientology hands out at disaster sites. And similarly, all of their directors, officers, employees, volunteers, agents, and attorneys. So virtually every Scientologist here in Russia, it applies to them as well. This order, series of orders and judgments <clears throat> sound completely bizarre, but it is very real. And it is my hope to both do something about this order, these orders, while I'm here, and to offer this extraordinary legal situation and my experience to Russia, who is standing up to whatever degree to Scientology. The European Human Rights Court has sided with Scientology, and my case and my situation demonstrates that Scientology is a massive human rights abuser. In that Scientology in the United States is considered a religion and seeks here in Russia to be recognized as a religion, these orders would be equivalent to penalizing someone $50,000 per utterance for saying the name God or sending someone to jail for talking about his experiences or knowledge in the Christian religion. And tomorrow, I believe I will be speaking to the Russian Justice Department uh, to offer them whatever assistance can be made of myself and my strange extraordinary legal situation. So I, I got into Scientology in uh, 1969 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And I was brought in in the same way that Scientology lures everyone in, promises of increased intelligence quotient or IQ. Scientology uh, promises that IQs will go up on average one point per hour of their therapy, their psychotherapy called auditing. And IQ is something which is measurable and is a secular matter, not a religious matter. I had over a thousand hours of Scientology auditing, <laughs> but at least I acquired uh, sufficient smarts to be able to leave the organization. Uh, in 1971, I joined what is known as the C organization. This is the uh, organization, the part of Scientology, which runs it around the world. And in, er, also in early 1971, I was sent to the ship which uh, L. Ron Hubbard was on the Apollo. At that time, we were uh, in Morocco, and we sailed up and down the Moroccan coast and to Portugal, uh, Spain, 
and the little Atlantic islands, Madeira, the Canaries. I started off on board uh, washing dishes. I became the storesman briefly, and then I became the ship's driver, the driver of a little car which we had on board. Beginning of 1972, I became the ship's legal officer. I was responsible for customs, immigration, police, uh, the uh, port, port authorities, tugboats, I hired them. I then became the public relations officer, and then in 1974, I became the ship's intelligence officer. And at, at that time, because of difficulties we were having in Europe, the ship sailed across the Atlantic, and we spent the next year in the Caribbean. Uh, Hubbard was on board during most of those years. He was off the ship briefly in 1973 because he was convicted of fraud in France. In 1975, the ship's complement came ashore in Florida. And I, I was close to Hubbard at the time. I was uh, then handling his uh, communications. I was sent on a mission from Florida to Los Angeles to set up a base. I got in an argument with his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard's secretary. Uh, Hubbard uh, had me locked up and then assigned me to uh, Scientology's uh, prison system, the Rehabilitation Project Force, or RPF. Uh, the existence of these RPF uh, re-education camps is a reason why every country should warn their citizens about this organization. I spent 17 months in the RPF at that time. I got out and was transferred uh, again to California to work with Hubbard shooting movies. And uh, again, he assigned me to the RPF, this time for joking. Uh, he got the idea that I was joking about his movie making. In fact, I was not. Inside Scientology, it was a crime to laugh about the wrong thing. I stayed eight months at that time in the RPF, and then when I got out, I worked in Hubbard's household unit at a new base that they had bought in Gilman Hot Springs, California. And Gilman Hot Springs is the current headquarters of Scientology, the present leader, David Miscavige, at the beginning of 1980, there was a threat of a raid. I understood what that, mean, that, that meant because the Federal Bureau of Investigation had raided Scientology in 1977. And 11 of its intelligence personnel were charged in United States federal court, convicted and sentenced to prison. There was a constant threat an awareness wherever I was in Scientology of a, th of a raid by police or other authorities. And at that time, everyone was ordered to destroy any documents which showed that Hubbard had been to the property, that he intended to live there, that he controlled Scientology or controlled Scientology finances. And in this search, <coughs> for documents which incriminated Hubbard, one of my juniors uh, discovered a box of very old material that in his personal archive. And she, she brought this box to me, and I decided that it should not be destroyed because of its historical value. And then we discovered approximately 20 boxes of similar material in Hubbard's personal effects. And I petitioned Hubbard to then assemble an archive of his personal documents and do the research for a biography. Ironically, Hubbard approved my petition, and I spent the next two years assembling this archive and working with an outside non-Scientologist writer by the name of Omar Garrison. And during the course of my research, and study of his personal documents, I deprogrammed myself. 
and I documented that he had lied about virtually every aspect of his life. He claimed, for example, to be a civil engineer and a nuclear physicist, and this was very significant to me. <coughs> it, uh, it was what it was in Scientology advertisements, which brought me in and kept me there for all those years. He in Scientology claimed that he had been crippled and blinded during the Second World War. Uh, he claimed to have been awarded 27 medals, including two Purple Hearts. He lied about his family, he lied about his wives, about, um. and he lied about uh, explorations, which he had claimed. So he was not a civil engineer, not, not a nuclear physicist. He flunked out of his second year of university. Regarding medals, he received four standard <laughs> service medals. He was not crippled and blinded. He was never wounded in action. He, in fact, was a malingerer. Importantly, when I began to see that Hubbard was a virtually a pathological liar, the whole of Scientology fell apart for me. I had to confront the fact that Scientology does not work. As I mentioned, my IQ did not go up one point. I didn't have any of the promised superpowers. And I had to confront the fact that I had wasted all those years and also confront the fact that now I was going to have this aggressive criminal organization target me. So I made plans and escaped. If I had not escaped, I would have again been locked up. And because of my state of mind at that time and my firm opposition to Scientology, I would have been kept there and killed. But I did successfully escape. And as I knew would happen, Scientology immediately targeted me. They, uh, in addition to assaulting me, which I've mentioned, they have uh, sued me six times. The first case in which they sued me went to trial in Los Angeles in 1984. And this is a, a very famous judgment in which the judge condemned fair game as a practice and declared Hubbard to be a pathological liar. Uh, Scientology could not stop at that, however, but have continued to this day to consider me a major enemy.